I want to welcome everyone to the Diatom Web Academy one more time. Uh, we're going to continue running this probably up until the field season starts in the summer, and then we'll think about how we bring it back again next fall. It's been a just a wonderful way for everyone to get together in, in community pretty much forever since the, the pandemic started. And it just seems like a really nice uh, opportunity to keep everyone um, coming together to learn about one, the one thing that we all we all share in common, which is, is diatom. Uh, three quick announcements today. Um, one is uh, we are uh, in two weeks, we're going to have our Diatom Web Academy. We had a, 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 a unfortunate conflict with our, our speaker, uh, Rosalina Stancheva, isn't going to be able to speak about Cochineus in two weeks. She's going to come back in the fall and we will uh, have, her, have her speak then. I want to thank uh, uh, Carolina Bilka from Lund University, who's going to step in. She's going to do a presentation on uncertainties surrounding the oldest fossil record of diatom. She's done some really interesting reanalysis of the famed Rothplest samples um, from Germany, and um, looking forward to, to hearing 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 the information that that she's going to share with us on that. Um, second, I we are. I just want to remind everyone that the uh, the ecology and systematics of diatoms class is going to be offered again this summer. It starts on about May 20, May 22nd, something like that, May 21st in, uh, at Iowa Lakeside Lab. And um, uh, Sylvia Lee and I will be teaching it this, this year. And I also wanna point out that um, the algae course that Kalina teaches is going to be offered as an online course this year. So a real easy opportunity for folks to um, get a you know, full breadth of uh, algae course um, from Kalina and not have to not have to travel. Uh, we'd all love to travel to Iowa, but uh, but we, we we're not going to be able to uh, for this year for for Kalina's course. Um, I do want to uh, probably one of the funnest things we get to talk about is uh, our, our 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 good our good friend and colleague Sarah Spalding um, received the. 2023 Elizabeth Jester Fellows Award for water quality for being a leader in water quality monitoring. This award is going to be given out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, it uh, at the at the National Water Conference, which is being held on, out at, out on the East Coast. Um, this is really recognizes Sarah for the important contribution she's made um, for, in everything from. You know our diatoms of North America website to helping coordinate and run some of the huge uh, monitoring programs in in uh, in North America from NACWA to Sesqua uh, to the the Western Western EMAP projects um, and including you know her long record of working in Antarctica working on Didymosphenia and, and and especially the record that she has in training people and I just want to say. Uh, I'll give a warm shout out to uh, Sarah that this is really a well, well, well deserved honor for her. Um, I want, and then finally, I want to get to today's presentation. It's really a, a, an honor and pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Regina Yan. Um, Regina is a um, She's a emeritus researcher. I talked to her the other day, getting ready for this, and she said the best part about it is. I just get to work on what I want to, and that's the fun stuff. <laughs> and I think I think we can all appreciate that. And she's going to talk about a little bit about that fun stuff that she gets to work on. Regina is a emeritus researcher with the uh, Botanical Museum in Berlin, and uh, really a pleasure to introduce her. And you can go ahead, Regina. We'll turn off our cameras, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you very much for attending. I was just looking at the title and thought how to name sounds like how to cook something, but it's not, it will not be cooking. It will be diatoms and it will not be how to, it will be more the story that has been told or has been told to me while doing this kind of research. Um, you all probably read the abstract. I just wanted to remind you that we're talking about clonal diatom cultures, which are a valuable research resource for research. 
and uh, because they have so much, so many valves, um, which can give us the opportunity to study the variability of their phenotypic features and morphometrics by light microscope and SEM, in addition to a lot of molecular data. But what we have done in the last years was we found that it is very, very complicated to identify these strains. You think that you find something and then it does turn out not to be the correct identification because all our um, data has been um, is based on mixed samples and we sometimes have data which is not clear cut taxonomic characters. So let me show you how we try to solve this problem. Um, first, the first idea is the question of single cells or cultures. Um, with single cells, we have the problem, um, they are often too small, they are, uh, and the linkage between the mo molecular and the morphological data is almost impossible because when they're small, data is lost. We have tried with single cells isolate with um, uh, gomphonil gomphonella tegelensis, the one below, because there the cells are big and they make colonies which are all of one descent. So at least you have more than just one cell to work with. But of course, we think the best is cultures where you have a lot of material. As you can see above, the Planotidium lanceolatum offers many valves for molecular data as well as morphological and morphometric studies. But see the size difference. Um, this size variation of Planetidium lanceolatum convinced the boss of an important project that we wanted to participate in, uh, the bar German barcoding of life, that we needed a lot of money for cultivating diatoms. He was the one that says, use single cells. I said, that's not possible. We're working on very tiny, tiny uh, organisms and also with a lot of variability. And when I had given the, shown this picture, he came up to me and said, I understand your point. So this gave us the chance to work with, uh, to, to employ somebody to do the, um, the strains. So when we do identification of diatom strains, we have the first choice of course is a perfect match, morphology and sequence data agree. Second is that we talk about cryptic species, morphology and sequence data disagree. We have the problem of under description Sequence data identifies more species than the morphologist can identify, but we also find over description. Morphologist separates species that are essentially genetically identi identical. You might think we don't need to talk about perfect match, but we found out there is actually no real perfect match. It just means you don't know enough. So I want to introduce the all the different parts to do integrative taxonomy. You have the sample up in the middle and uh, have some habitat data. You can use the entire sample for meta barcoding, but that's not our topic today. You can make uh, isolate single cells and make clone cultures. From this one, you can do DNA sequencing. And um, you can you can also make um, uh, use it for uh, uh, photography. So you have a lot of valves you can take photos of. You can go under the SEM and then you use identification books, papers, online resources, trying to identify what you found. And if you get stuck, you go to reference collections and find, try to identify your species. So this, is, this was my start actually into identifying um, Planotidium lanceolatum. Well, I thought it was lanceolatum. Uh, my student gave me um, a couple of here, six, six sculptures from one sample and said, could you please identify that? I did, I had two taxa. I found lanceolatum and frequentissimum. 
But he came back to me and said, uh-uh, I need three. I have three molecular data here, I need three. So I went back and found out that I had missed one. I thought it was a perfect match, it was not the perfect match. And in the end, we had a lot of samples, a lot of strains, and we uh, could make this um, gene tree. Um, but the first question uh, that um, I, I have, so to speak, grown up in dietome research, when there was still the question, is there a sinus and a carbum or the hood and the indentations, or is that all just one? Uh, and we could show that the sinus clade is separate from the carbon clade. And these two are separate from the, the um, Planotidium sunshan manense, which, um, which is outside and which has no sinus and no carbon. The morphology, then we went into the morphology of the Planotidium and we found that there's so many more data to be found when you look in the SEM. The number of areole rows, rows, the size of the inner areole row, you can see here in the lanceolatum, it is smaller inside. The form of the carbon opening, scratches, scratching versus indentations. I didn't show a picture because Wetzel had just, has just Carlos Wetzel has recently shown that. This is also an important character. And also, you had a longer talk last year by Marina Potapova on this topic. So I don't want to elaborate on that. Whoops, what happened here? Oops, I went too fast. So here we are again. So let me take you into the nomenclatural history of Planotidium lanceolatum. In 1846, Kutzing described Achnantidium lanceolatum from material of Brebesson, France. 1818, Bruno recombined it as Hernandez lanceolata. 1982, 100 years later, Moss and Carter recognized that the typical hoof mark in the sternum valve can be differentiated into specimens with a single sinus or a double hoof mark, carbon. 1991, in their famous book, Kammer and Lange Bertalot differentiated Lanceolata subspecies Lanceolata with a sinus, with a sinus, from Lanceolata subspecies frequentissima with a carvum. And in 1999, Lange Bertalo raised them to species rank and recombined them with a new genus Planotidium. Fortunately for us, in 2013, Bart van der Pfeiffer analyzed the type material of Achnantidium Lanceolatum. And in 13 and 14, Wetzel et al. published a number of new planotidium species. So we had a big resource to work from. And uh, in 2017, we published the molecular data of planotidium lanceolatum and others with the conviction that it coincides not only morphologically, but also molecularly with the type. So I want to show you two problems we ran into. We have here is the um, Planotidium victory, which had been described by Novis in et al. in 2012. And it turned out that Planotidium victory had exactly the same molecular data as Planotidium, uh, Planotidium capuzium. So we had to check what to do. This, those two strains have the same molecular data, but different morphometrics. As you can tell, Planotidium victory is uh, shorter, has a smaller width, has different striae, but the molecular data is the same. And it was described before ours. So unfortunately, we had to sink our species into synonymy. And we were very much disappointed because Planotidium victory is actually a teratological uh, species, uh, not a species, but the, the, the form from the culture turned out to be only teratological. But we used Planot Capuzium, no, it was Capuzium as an epitype of victory so that you could find at least the morphology that fits with the species. 
what am I doing here? I'm constantly doing something wrong. Sorry. Okay, and then we had another question on how to identify. We had found a planotidium which looked exactly like uh, subantarcticum described by Bart van der Pfeiffer. Um, but sub and this species was described from the subantarctic, but our strain came from Faroe Islands, which is subarctic, but they look morphologically the same. We discussed with Bart back and forth what to do and decided the biogeography and, and his wish made us to identify it only as a CF, which means referred to, because we cannot be sure that's the same. But the morphology is very much the same. And here we come to an old ecological question. In 2007, um, a group um, in Göttingen asked us to identify a diatom, diatoms in a first version of the study in order to see which species accompany calcification in a creek. They produced a number of strains and many O2s. And at, in 2007, the reference library at Genbank was not very good. Um, but interestingly enough, most important was O241, which belonged to the Symbelalis and was not a Gomphonema. Here you see the gene tree to that. And you can see there are a number of Gomphonema there, but no Gomphonema down there. This species, um, I had expected, by the way, uh, Gomphonema olivaceum, which is one of the most uh, common diatoms in rivers in Central Europe, but it was not there. But it only this O241, and uh, when I asked and said, no, it cannot be a Gomphonema, it has to be something like Symbopleura or Enzunema, and something along those lines, because it belongs to the Symbelaceae rather than to the Gomphonema taceae. So during our project, German barcoding of life, diatoms, we had this very common diatom species and culture, of course. But we found out that the vows in, uh, in, um, the, in, in the culture did not look very much like uh, the ones from life samples of a natural population, as you can see here. My colleague asked me why I why I decided to name them nevertheless Gomphonema olivaceum, I said, because they, I have seen so many of them are also teratological forms in Berlin waters that I'm pretty sure it's the same. Um, and uh, we were very much surprised when we saw that, um, that when we blasted the, the molecular data, um, that this turned out to be O241. So finally, we had the name for that O241. But now we needed to find out what's the problem here. It looked like it is easy to link the sequence data to the Crocs species, but suddenly it turned out that we had two names. We had Gomphonema olivaceum and Gomphonees olivacea. What happened here? So what, when you have problems like that, you have to find the type. So we needed to find the type. We started with the description of the first author and uh, thought that the material might be with him. The, the name uh, Lyngby uh, came in there at some point. So we were a little bit unsure and put uh, the creators in, Lung, uh, in Lund, in uh, Copenhagen, to work to find what we're looking for. And at the end, it turned out that Professor Hornemann had laid out the species epithet olivacea as Ulva olivacea in Flora danica. You see the bubbles on the right hand side. Lyngby had prepared his material while he was in Copenhagen. He later worked in Lund, but the material was still in Copenhagen. So we contacted the curator in Copenhagen and said, oh, please send us Hornemann's material. And she came back to us and say, here is the picture of Hornemann's that is not a diatom. 
We said, mm, please, the picture is beautiful, but please send us the material. And then Copenhagen uh, came back to us and said, oh dear, I'm sorry, but the material has been sent on loan already in 1965, 50 years ago to the Diatome Herbarium in Philadelphia. So we both uh, contacted Marina and said, could you please find the material and send it? And she wrote back, sorry, we cannot find the material. And then finally, six months later, it's really great to have email. She, she contacted us and said, we found it and we will send it immediately. So we were very happy and we were, of course, very curious if this material coincided with today's concept. And we looked and it did. It does coincide up top in the in red is the type material of Hornemanns and the specimen below are from Berlin waters. So it fits, lovely. So now we have cleared that the type is the same. But what about the name? What is the nomenclatural history here? So it turns out that Gomphonema or Gomf that, that this uh, taxon has gone through all the names possible at that time. So it was Ulva Olivacea. It was Echinella Ol Olivaceum. It had been also combined. Uh, that, that's a no, not nomenclature, but more the taxonomy. People also thought it was Meridium Vernale, Gomphonema Leiblini, and Gomphonema Clavatum. But those is the taxonomy, not the, the, mole, uh, the, the nomenclature history. But it was also called Frustulia, it was called Symbella, until it was finally called Gomphonema Olivaceum by Ehrenberg in 1838. Ribeson had named it the same in a few months later. Um, and then in uh, 1950 years, years later, uh, Dawson recognized that there were B seriate striae in this species, and she recognized it in electron microscope. And that's when she decided that this has to belong to Gomphonese olivaceae. So, um, and this has been kept like that for the, for the next 50 years in Europe, mostly being called Gomphonema olivaceum and in America, um, Gomphonese olivaceum. Now we compared Gomphonema with Gomphonese, two small species, one olivaceum up top and lower one Gomphonema minutum. And you can see that both have B series trie, but the lower one is a gomphonema, the upper one is not a gomphonema. The, you can see the Corelli at the foot poles are different here and there. The raphi are different. You see here, there's always a bent in there, there's no bent in there. And most importantly, I think, is the, the girdle view, because here they just stop abruptly with Gomphonella olivaceum, whereas in Gomphonema minutum, they keep on continuing into small little dots. So it is neither Gomphonema nor Gomphonese, but it needed a new um, genus name. And then we found out that Abenhorst in 1853 had already made a Gomphonella olivaceum, Acea, uh, which was reduced by Brun to a section of Gomphonema. So what about phylogenetic relations? We, you can see that Gomphonella olivacea plus three other species makes a very nice cluster. And the Gomphonema minutum that I just showed you and the Gomphonema acuminatum sit down here. Same for the RBCL gene tree. What am I doing? I keep on doing the wrong ones. I'm so sorry. So here we see more Gomphonella. We have in our cultures, we also had Gomphonella axiae from Lake Balaton and Gomphonella coxiae from a lake close to Poland. 
and we had found this invasive species that we had the year before uh, identified as Gomphonaeus tigelensis. Now we had to rename it into Gomphonella tigelensis. And here you can see the data, the morphological data much more precisely than with a small Gomphonella. You can see it has fine pores in this tree, eh? as you can see here. It has up to three here, not only B. And you can see down here at the football, how the similar areole in the valve phase as in the football, they are look very similar and they move into each other. There is no stop there. In uh, Europe, we have only, we have very small, very few large Gomphonella in Europe. One is Gomphonella transylvanica. That was the name that was usually given to the ones that we uh, gave the name Tigelensis. We looked at the type and found out that it is fossil, the occurrence is fossil, and it's actually coming from Brackish uh, sites. Um, the only one that could have fit was Gomphonella ochidana, which is extant, but it is supposed to occur in Lake Ochid, which is oligotrophentic. And so is supposed to be endemi uh, in the show endemism. And it has only two areolae on the sphere. So we had to give a new name to our Gomphonella and we called it Tiglensis because it's ultrafentic, invasive in Europe, and it has mostly three striae, uh, areolae per striae. So what about Gomphonase? We had talked about Gomphonella, we have talked about, we have not talked about Gomphonase, but there's an, there another two Gomphonase. Minuta sitting here, also Minuta, just like the Gomphonema. And they are next to Gomphonema. They are actually in the same plate as Gomphonema. So we have decided that this problem will be solved at a different time. If you will get the story next month at the Central European Diatom meeting. So, but we want to talk about the Gomphonema story. The story of the genus Gomphonema Ehrenberg has to start with the type of the name of the genus, which is Gomphonema acuminatum. Since a number of taxa are closely related, such as truncatum and capitatum, we define them as belonging to the core group. We produce 60 uni cultures of Gomphonema acuminatum complex. 52 of our own strains were newly established from German, Spain, France, Finland, Faroe Islands, Korea, Croatia, and Mexico. We used two markers, 18S and RBCL, and the morphological studies were done with light microscope and high resolution SEM. Now, again, how to find the correct name. We had to check the collections for the type of the name of the species. In the case of Acuminatum, Capitatum, and Truncatum, it is the Ehrenberg collection, and all three types have been studied and published. How fortunately for us. So let me quickly go into the Ehrenberg collection with you. Um, Bart van der Weyfer told you the story of the detective in the museum a few weeks ago. And uh, here's another uh, old collection where you can play detective because it provides original material for the calibration of taxon names, samples, drawings, and preparations. This is our way of linking the past to the future. So again, I'm stupid. I should not do that again. So. Sorry that you have to run down again and again and again. So here we are. Um, in the case of Gomphonema acuminatum, we found it here in the gene tree. We found it in a canal. And here is Ehrenberg's drawing. We published this in uh, already 2004. Here's his drawing. Here is his material. We think that he probably do the drawings from this here. And this is the, the data we got together for that. 
So we thought that we know what acuminatum looks like. We have uh, 60 strains, as I said before, and we studied our own strains. And here you can see, we put all the valves next to each other, all the different shapes. We have an acuminatum complex and we have a truncatum and capitatum complex. And uh, we want to focus now on the truncatum capitatum complex. You see the shapes are almost the same, but as Reichert had already seen in 2001 when he looked at the Ehrenberg collection, they are different. Here you have B seriat stria in the truncatum, or at least most of the time. And in the capitatum, you have big uh, iole, which are never B seriat. Here you can see that we have eight, had eight strains from Korea, the one with the K, or from Mexico, and from German waters, and here 15 is from Faroe Island. And then we were sorting them so that they would fit into taxonomic concepts. And now we have seven names and eight uh, strains. And it looks, so, sounds like it could be easy, but it was a mess. You can see here that the names have different, are composed of different strains. So that does not fit. Here you have, as uh, Lati Colum Reichert, you've got three valves from Korean waters, three, wa three uh, valves from Mexican waters. Here again, you have Korean, and uh, he is also Korean, and they're all over the place. So that is very, very complicated. So what do we do now? We looked at the molecular data, and it shows you that capitatum is just one taxon. And you can see also here, you have, um, we, in the acuminatum group, we have more. We have tried very hard because to, to have to describe some varieties for the many different valve forms that we had. We have anguste cephalum, we have subclavatum va subclavatum, we have subclavatum va pomeranum, and here we have mexicanum, neotropicum, and truncatum. So we found actually seven subclades and from our material, of course, it's, it's only our own material that we have. And, um, and uh, yeah. So our combined morphological and molecular data results separated 12 taxa, seven species, which do not reflect current splits and taxonomy, especially concerning shape. But Gomphonema acuminatum and the truncatum capitatum complexes have long been recognized as highly variable species with broad ecological tolerances. Many species and varieties have been described from all over the world, but these current taxonomic concepts are not supported by our study. As you have seen, within one culture, valve shapes occurred, which can be assigned to different taxa. And now a few words to the Coconet story. This is one of the stories that we're just sitting at and working with uh, Rosalina. Um, in 2009, we already typified Coconet's pediculus from Berlin waters. You can see here the Ehrenberg's drawings and names. This is down here, those are modern samples, but this is one of the old samples. This is very difficult to see because the material is pressed between two mica, nothing in between. Um, the type locality is waters in Berlin. And so we decided to make an epitaph from strain of a river in Berlin so that we know what we're talking about. The other one is Coconese placentula. I know that a lot of people are very unhappy with this decision but it was the second one that we could find in Berlin waters. We didn't find any else but those two. 
the pediculus and the placentula. And since you described, Ian Beck described both those two from Berlin waters, we thought we should stick with that. Isn't it interesting here how, how much the drawing coincides with the sample? I think that's unbelievable, interesting after almost 200 years of well cupped material. Um, the second paper about lineata and oglypta is a little bit more complicated and much more not, not as satisfying as, as the other one, because here we have the problem that the type locality of lineata is aeolian dust sample collected in Lyon, France. So because we thought currently the uh, lineata is, is uh, reported from clean rivers, we thought a strain from a creek and on fire islands might help, might be a good ecological uh, place. Coconese oglypta um, was actually, the type locality is from a river in Florida, USA. And, uh, but here we chose as an epitype a strain from the Baltic Sea at Wismar, Germany. I think this can be debated, but as you can see, the, the looks look quite good. Um, we also had um, coconese, we found coconese in uh, Korea. And so we described Koreana to the left and Sijong Hoensis. Uh, the molecular data of Sijong Hoensis has recently been found also in samples not from Korea. This is the interesting things when you do meta barcoding. Um, yeah, in, in some ways this was an easy story because I did not recognize any of these. And uh, so, I, and it was a different place and I did only find them there. So I thought that we are quite sure that these are new species and not already been described somewhere else. But to understand the whole story of coconase is, um, you need to know that it's generic type, the type of the name of the genus, which is coconase butenum from uh, Wisma, Baltic Sea in Wisma. Its typification had already been done by Mizurumo in 1987, but we need strains for molecular data from its type locality, Baltic Sea at Wisma. We had already tried to get it into culture and two failures turned out to be Coconese oglypta and Coconese crawfordi, but we're now certain that we have got several strains which fit with Ian Beck's Coconese gutenum. Uh, you can see here that we published Coconese crawfordi for Dick Crawford, two years ago. Coconese are difficult to isolate and grow in cultures. Nevertheless, we have now at least 10 more taxa to be newly described. So in conclusion, I would like to say a new era in diatom taxonomy has begun. Progress in diatom taxonomy comes with every technical innovation. From light microscope, via SEM to sequence data, coupled with high quality SEM. We need trained taxonomists to push this progress. I remember Dick Crawford telling me some years ago that there was a big problem when SEM came into normal uh, research. People were quite upset with that because it changed their concepts of taxonomy. And here we, here we are again, we are again changing concepts in taxonomy. We need integrative taxonomy, which combines all available evidences, molecular and micromorphologically, in identification of natural population with the help of clonal cultures. We need nomenclatural evaluation, alive cells, habitat observations, and then we can produce reference library for modern monitoring, for example, via meta barcoding. And we, we, we get insights into their biogeography and phylogeny. Especially the American colleagues, I would like to refer to the Ehrenberg collection. You might not know that many common taxa have been described from Germany, but also from the Americas, just like the 
Cognes or Glypta. I didn't know until I looked into the collection that it was not a German species. And I have a plea to the diatom community, taxonomy, com taxonomy community. Describe new taxa only when you have as much evidence available as possible. For the sake of our future, we need to apply modern methods and concepts. Find colleagues to cooperate. Integrative diatom taxonomy needs many skills and takes a lot of time. It is a difficult task for the individual, but easier when you do it in cooperation. And with this, I would like to thank my fantastic team, my diatom research group. Those are the four members of the core team with their core expertise. In the meantime, they know everything of everything, but those are their core expertise. But we also have a number of former students which and, uh, and people that got me into molecular data, including technical assistants. And of course, whenever possible, we would like to cooperate with colleagues worldwide. And here is some of the funding that we got. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that, that your, your presentation, Regina. Uh, wonderful work. And, and I really, I, I, can, I can really admire how you've built a team that can tackle these very challenging problems. Let's, let's move into the, um, the question and answer um, period here. Um, what uh, you, if you if you if you want, we got looks like we got about twenty three folks online. If you'd like to ask a, you know, if you want to raise your question, we can have you turn or raise your hand using the, uh, I guess it's the reaction feature at the bottom. Um, you can do that, and we can call on you. Uh, otherwise, if you, if you want, you can also just feel free to type your question in the in the chat, and we can we can pose that to Regina. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just start with just a, a quick comment. I had um, I had I think I had long recognized that that the 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 challenges we face with describing species and the differences. And I had I don't know that I had ever heard the term that you, you terms that you provide to them this under description and over description. And I just I just I wanted to um, I think you ended your talk sort of saying you know providing a path forward and a solution to that, um, you know, to, to the conflict that those two things have. Do you have any other, um, you know, any other strategies that we might be thinking of to make sure we're not under or over describing species? No. No. Yeah. I, we just have to look at the stuff. We have yep. to look at it. We have to see the evidences. I think, I mean, uh, I have not talked about, uh, as you you all like the, the photos of the, with the chloroplast. So I have not looked at the cell itself sure. yet. I mean, not even at the living cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is also lots of, there's so many things that can be studied. Okay. Um, can you, um, one thing, can you see, I'm trying to see if I can see if folks have their hands up here. One question I have in, in regarding um, your use of strains in, um, in identifying you know, in, in, in identifying new species, what are the challenges you have for, um, is it making, you know, making microscope slides of those strains and using them as the types? Is it depositing material from the original collection that that clone was isolated from? Or is it just depositing material from the the clone itself, and and then also depositing the molecular strains. What are the strategies for that? Well, you have to deposit everything, and I think this is so important that that you make things available. We were just looking for material, for example, from um, you have seen that we're talking going on with a Gomphonese uh, mm -hmm. story next month. Um, we have been looking for. Uh, stuff that has been described or where the molecular data is available for Gomphonae spec species, whatever it is, but we haven't seen it. We have seen a small photograph of it and it would be lovely if we could get to the material. So a very, very important plea is do 
with everything you do, do leave stuff in the museum, do leave, do document, leave vouchers. I mean, you're all asked for uh, to, to send the voucher, so to speak, the data for the molecular data to GenBank. This is all mm -hmm. uh, very important, but you also should leave your molecular data, uh, your morphological data somewhere. Or if you haven't done any more morphological data, leave your strains so that people can get at it. Uh, I don't know if you, oh, I, I didn't give uh, the, um, the example of um, Kokone's um, Chaneki, where we, where we were so, where it was great, it was positive that we found the material still in a collection in, the, in Texas University, uh, Texas A&M University, I think. And, uh, and we could look at it and see um, the differences and could say it's not a placentula, it is not whatever, it is different species. Mm -hmm. we, we knew it was a different species because it did not fit with ours that we had, but it, we didn't know what it was because we couldn't see the morphology. So in that sense, it, so if, if those things are available, then people can really work and understand what's going on. Thank you. Um, Leila, you've, you've raised your hand. Can you, uh, can you go ahead and unmute and you can turn on your camera even if you'd like and ask your question, please. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Regina. Um, I wanted, uh, uh, if I understood, you said that uh, the, the group of Trencatum uh, Capitatum, when you made your molecular uh, analysis, uh, it happens that it's just one taxon. So uh, now, I mean, uh, you, you call it only Capitatum, uh, but the morphological point of view is not the same. Uh, this is my first question, and please, for the second, uh, what do you do with the extinct species? Um, uh, we have uh, several uh, uh, fossil species in core. Uh, we don't, we can't make culture. Uh, how you deal with uh, this to uh, to make your taxonomy? Thank you very much. Um, um, I, of course, we can only say capitatum is one species for. The, the, the strains that we had in culture, okay? Yeah. I mean, don't, we cannot make a general generalization. Only for the species that we had in cultures, we can say that. Um, you might want to read the, the, the paper by Nelida Abaka because she also did quite some, some um, uh, nomenclatural stuff trying to understand what's going on. The only thing that we realized was this one that is completely over-described, and, but in the, the most of the um, differentiating characters were laid on the shape. And we could tell you that the shape is not the key factor in Gomphonema core group. Terrible, I know, I know it's terrible because <laughs> they're so beautiful. The shapes are so beautiful, accuminatum, and they all look beautiful. And, but when you describe every little shape as something different and they all appear in one culture, you know, they cannot be different. They have to be the same. So, you, you should read read it. I mean, I cannot give you the, the I cannot give you the free way to say everything that looks like capitatum is only capitatum. Mm -mm. That life is not as easy as that is taxonomy not either. either. Um, at least the ones that we had in the in the, in the hand. Um, Sorry, yeah. uh, Regina. In fact, I have something uh, similar in a core from Kenya, um, oh. and that's why I don't know what to call it now. No, I mean, in that sense, I mean, you have to rely on, 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 on uh, identification. So the, the good, the best thing is make, take pictures and say after which literature you identified it so that people can go back later and see, okay, she called that, mm -hmm, okay. uh, I don't know, capitatum, but actually nowadays we would call them, I don't know, toncatum or whatever. So um, I think it's very, very important to, to, document what you've seen and how you uh, identified it. And then it's, it's uh, people can later redo what you did. And I think this is the only thing I can tell you also for the, for the other questions and just when you are having um, um, paleontology stuff, you can only do it what you, what you got. And you have to have the people that, that work with molecular data, of course, uh, try to give you better better identification books in a few years, decades, who knows? 
Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Leila. Um, uh, Rosalina is on and has posed a question in the chat that says, um, do you know if the Cochineus taxa might have specific environmental ranges or do they all prefer meso to eutrophic conditions? And do you think Cochineus taxa could be good indicator species considering the difficulty that we have distinguishing them in the light microscope and environmental samples? Ah, Rosalina, I think you know that better than me, I think. <laughs> uh, because um, I think they have, they, they have. Uh, the, the, the better we know, uh, I mean, the better we know them and the more we divide them uh, by, by, by their real identity, the better we can use them for, uh, for um, biomonitoring, I think. And, uh, and uh, I, I do, I, I, for, we, I think we, don't, we do not know enough. I mean, the interesting thing, like this, the, the one, the Korean one, the Si Jong Ho that I described from North Korea had been found uh, in uh, some waters. Oh, I forget, Dimitrio will know. Uh, that's very interesting to find. That this is the interesting thing about the meta barcoding. You can find things suddenly again when you have the barcodes of the individual species and you find them in a in a meta barcoding sample. You know that they are there. And you, well, I mean, in the beginning, I remember that uh, Jonas Zimmermann when he started, he he said, I have I have my meta barcoding barcoding tells me I have six or seven Coconay species in the Odra River. But I said, I only have two names for you. That's all, I can't, I, there are no more names. So, um, and since he didn't have cultures, I could not check the names. And you, you just have the molecular data. I yeah. think Rosalina, you have a good good work to do there. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Regina, and uh, for including me in uh, your team. I think we really have a lot of uh, work to do on companies, but always because I'm a very practical person uh, and I'm a kind of bench taxonomist, always I'm uh, asking myself how we could apply this to the practical taxonomy and how we could use them as indicators. Uh, because I really hope that we could build a very nice uh, systematics of coconut, but then how we are applying this back to uh, environmental studies, uh, because that is my passion to meet the practical application of your uh, great molecular work. That is very, I think this, this part is very important. And that's why I think it's a good idea for us to work together so that we also cover that part of the, uh, of the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalina. Uh, David, checking in from um, Gray London. You go, go ahead and turn turn your camera on and unmute yourself. And, um... I, I, I am, and it's getting grayer by the moment. Um, <laughs> uh, and because it's getting grayer, I tend to be one of nature's cynics. So let me, I, this is troubling me, this whole idea of over-described and under-described. Um, uh, to be able to say you over-describe something or under-describe something assumes you know something about what is to be described. Otherwise, you would never know that it's over-described or under-described. Um, I hope that makes sense. You have to know something before you can say it's over-described. You have to know something else, the same thing, though it's under-described. Now, if you could put your second slide back up there, please, which, which tells us what those two things mean. Then I'll ask my question. I think it was the second slide. Uh, third, uh, the one that talked about under this, well, fourth, fifth, I don't know, sorry. That, there it that's is. the one. <clears throat> right. Um, I, I, I just kept thinking about that slide most of the time. Um, I, I, I find there's, um, uh, I'm trying to find the right word, it troubles me. Um, so if the morphology and secret data disagree, then there's a real thing there, but they're cryptic. If they agree, there's a real thing there because they agree. Um, what you're not telling me is, and, and what that really tells me is you're doubting the morphological data can tell you anything unless you have these molecular data there to substantiate that. What it's telling me, actually what I translate that into is that you're telling me the molecular data are telling you the uh, truth. Um, I, 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 I simply don't go with that. Now, what are you, what, what are you doing? What, what, 
part of your scheme, your outline, are you doing to show me that it's not the molecular data that are misleading? I don't know. I don't know so why the molecular data, molecular data could be wrong. I mean, then. we're talking we're talking about uh, features, right? Characters or features. So what are you telling me about morphology? If you're telling me morphology is a certain morphology is a feature and it turns out it's not a feature, same with the molecular data. It can be a feature, it cannot be a feature. There's something that we both agree or don't agree apparently. Um, I think morphology, if you, if you have a feature, it's a feature. Um, it's straightforward. In molecular are... data, you have an awful lot of, Homoplasia now, at least as far as the molecular data I've ever looked at. But what seems to happen now, and it kind of slightly irritates me, is that molecular trees are put up there. Nothing's there to tell me what that is. Um, I don't know whether that's a towering mass of homoplasia in there. Um, I have absolutely no idea. And then you tell me that you find a cock and ass from Korea, you sequence it, and it's the same thing you've got in Germany. My immediate thoughts tell me something's wrong with your molecules. Nothing's wrong with your morphology. Now, I, what I want to know is what you guys are doing to, uh, uh, I, that's my question again then, what you guys are doing to show that the molecular data uh, are substantial in some way. They don't really tell me anything. Okay. If they so don't what, tell you anything, then we There's nothing being done to show that the molecular not, data have some substance okay. to them. Okay. You're, you're asking philosophical questions. It's then not you, a straightforward empirical question. Um, it, if if homoplasia is there, you need, to tell, you need to tell me it's homoplasia. It's an empirical question. It's not a philosophical question. Absolutely when you, empirical. Okay. When you do, okay, let me start it from this side. When you do meta barcoding, yep. you're using the entire molecular data that you have in there and trying to yep. do some uh, barcoding there, uh, and uh, which will tell you something on, on uh, uh, or the quality of the water whenever you have a whenever you have something to calibrate it with okay um that's why you need something to refer it to and that's why you need molecular the same molecular data or the barcode that you use for meta barcoding you need for the reference library otherwise you cannot combine those two things well i'm not interested in combining I, i'm interested in knowing how you know that your data are not misleading that's what I'm interested in. No idea. Morphology is straightforward. We know when it's misleading, or at Molecular least we can work data. out when it's. We, we can work out when it's misleading. We can look Mor at something and morphology and can be also very much misleading. Sure, think I'm agreeing your, to that. I, I know no, that. David, David, think of your first statistics that you did, and yep. some of the molecular mor morphological data you sent said there. Yep. You could not know better because there was not enough uh, good pictures at that time to be able sure. to know what was first and was what second that's just a question of uh, uh of uh, how good your sem was or how good your light microscope was when you don't see a riolet and you don't see what's inside you cannot say much about the the morphology well and again I, time, I, I i have to i have to disagree with you what what i did in my first analyses was present hypotheses of relationships it has nothing to do with technology the hypothesis of relationship is an empirical understanding of how things are related now you have uh, lots of molecules and your colleagues have lots of molecules i tell you constantly if you look at my papers i tell you constantly how my where the flaws are in that where the morphologies may be letting me down i never see that in any molecular paper Ever, ever see it. And what I do know when I've experimented with morphological molecular data is there are a towering inferno of homoplasy. In other words, it, it, it's all nonsense. You're bound to get a tree because you put it into a tree building program. <coughs> How could you fail? It is not easy to make a tree, believe me. Yeah. It's dead easy to make a tree. I could do it now. You send them to me now and I can make you 200 different trees from different, different programs. Okay. Well, it's, every it's, program is designed to give you a hierarchical tree, so you'll get a tree, whatever happens. I just well, don't know. What I'd like to know is some, some, I, I, science is about the measure of doubt. I want to know the measure of doubt on that. <clears throat> um, I, it, it sounds, I mean, we've reached the top of the hour. I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to thank Re Regina for, for presentation today.
clearly we've we've um, opened up some avenues of collaboration here. I I I think I think it, it would be I think you know we're we're all we we've 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 heard uh, very strong proposals of collaboration in how we approach the species descriptions and identification of species and and phylogenies. And I think it's it's really open an opportunity to answer those questions, the questions that all of us have. And I hope that uh, I hope that we can we can continue to go forward. I suspect at least a couple of these folks are going to be showing up at that uh, European diatom meeting in a few weeks and and can continue these conversations. Again, in two weeks, um, uh, Carolina Brilka from University of Lund in Sweden is going to be talking some more about the uh, 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 our oldest diatom fossils, the Jurassic fossils from the rock plus material and what they tell us. And I just want to also encourage if people are out there willing and wanting to you know, present some of their information and, and do a diatom web academy, we're always looking for speakers to, to join us in this process. And I, I'm sure we'll be coming back next fall with a, another, another round of this because it, it is a, such a great opportunity to, to do this. Um, Again, I'd like to thank Re Regina for um, for her her wonderful work in in, in doing this. And uh, I saw Sarah Sarah jumped in earlier, and you may have missed the congratulations we gave you, Sarah, on the uh, on being awarded the Elizabeth uh, Jester Fellow Fellows Award. <laughs>